at four minutes late. Precisely 6.30. Uh, let's see here. All right. I do try to hit this off on time, but every now and then I am up to four minutes late. That's it. So uh, in the last class, we covered the first three chapters. And those chapters were uh, the getting started chapter, which is everyone's favorite. That's the one where you take home the least and put in the least amount of work. That's a good one. And then we did uh, the guessing game, and we kind of iteratively worked through the guessing game. Whoa, wait, by the way, I'm not showing you my screen. Someone would eventually said, I don't see what you're talking about. And then it would have been clear. Uh, XR NAR output. Oh, ah ha ha, there's my blue. That's right. All right, that's that beautiful shade we're all looking for. Okay. Uh, so we covered the guessing game. And in the guessing game, we had really built up something that, uh, that we could, we could uh, it would generate a number, and then we would guess the number. It would tell us too high, too low, until we got it right, and then it would peacefully exit. And that was a beautiful game. OK. Uh, and today, and then we, we also did uh, common programming concepts. We covered variables, mutability, constant. What's the difference between an immutable variable and a constant? Did anyone remember the answer to that? Right, uh, but we would use a different word. What's the actual word we use? When you take an immutable variable and you replace it with another immutable, aha, uh -huh, there we go. So, boom, did you, you read the book today? You come to the class with the next three chapters read? Yes, sir. Yes, there you go. See, he's ahead of his shit. He's gonna come out here, Rust programmer number one. So you, everyone's competing for number two at this point. Uh, <laughs> We did that. We also covered, uh, let's, let's actually give a quick run through this and see if any of these spur questions, and we'll make sure we're up on it. Does anyone here have any questions about what shadowing is? We recall what that is? Okay, who wants to do a job at describing shadowing? Anyone want to give it a crack? Okay, we've got to get that, guys. We, have to, we, we explained it on the last class. Did anyone remember what shadowing is? This is not good if we're losing you this quick. We have two variables, and they both share the same name, right? But they represent different things in memory, different spots in memory. So when you're in a scope, you can effectively uh, know a different piece of memory by the same name. And we would say that that new name has shadowed the old name. So in this scope right here, we have let x equals x times 2, and we are shadowing the x above it. So both of these are known as x, but they refer to two different pieces of memory. Uh, and we also have, we went over some data types. We talked about how when we built our guessing game, we took in that number from the user and it was a string and we had to change it. And does anyone remember how we changed it? What did we do to change it? We called parse, right? So we take this string and we were able to trim it and then parse it. And when we parsed it, it magically became the thing we wanted. And that's because we had this type inference, right? So if we have a, a, an integer and we try to parse a string, parse knows what do I got to get to? I need to get to an integer. And what do I have? I have a string. So it knows how to run that conversion for us. And that's nice. Uh, we talked about the different types of integers we have. So we had 8, 16, 32, 64, all the different binary forms of integers. And we talked about why they're beneficial. They're usually faster and smaller, uh, of course. Don't prematurely optimize things, but that's how it works. And we have these different ways of writing integers, too. We talked about some of this. We have decimals. We have hex. We have octal. Most of the stuff we won't ever use, but it's there. So you can write them in different ways. And we went through some of those. Uh, numeric operations aren't uh, immensely complex here. They pretty much work in any language this way. Uh, I would say some of the bigger differences are that they are type specific. So, you know, division doesn't naturally promote one type to another type. We had a Boolean type, pretty simple there. And we have a character, which represents a Unicode character, right? It's uh, four bytes for a character. You can store any Unicode piece in it. So it's not like an ASCII character if you're used to other languages. We also talked about a tuple. These are strongly typed pieces of data, and they can have different things inside of them. 
And we also showed how they were interior, we had interior mutability on a tuple. So if you put something inside of a tuple that is mutatable, you can go ahead and grow it or whatever, but the tuple itself can't change types. Okay. And we also covered functions. Uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions about this, raise your hand. I'm just running through it. I want to make sure we didn't miss anything. We covered comments, and I also showed uh, one of my favorite features about Rust, which is the doc comments, right? And I showed you why I like the doc comments. And we didn't even cover that in the book yet, but what is the difference between a comment and a doc comment? Does anyone remember that? One extra slash, right? And then you can run a cargo doc and you can get all your stuff documented. So you write your documentation above the code, unless you're insane. That's how everyone does it. One more slash and it tells Rust, I am commenting the code below me. So it's not just this nebulous thing that, you know, sits somewhere. You're actually telling Rust, I'm commenting this thing. And Rust is smart enough to figure out what that thing is you're commenting and then it can even generate you books for it. You can choose if you want to sit over there or over here. We've got plenty of seats, you know. Okay. And uh, all right, and then control flow. Let's, let's go ahead and click that one up too. This is pretty simple. These are just our ifs. I think we did a, a match statement in there. We did loops. We talked about loops. They loop, the loop returns the very last thing that you break on. That's the, the return statement of a loop. Okay. So ownership. Uh, so the deal is that this is, I would say, one of the more complex areas of Rust. And we don't have to dive into it that much for the purposes of this book, which is nice. Unfortunately, when you learn how to program with Rust and you get into it, you're going to dive into it a lot deeper. So uh, I would say this is an introduction to one of the hardest concepts in Rust and one of the most unique concepts in Rust. And at a very high level, it's an important to know why the complexity is there so you're not hitting your head around it, right? So I don't think the book is very clear here about why the concept exists. Why don't any other languages do it like this? Let's actually hit on that. Uh, the concept of ownership is created because there's a problem Rust is solving. And the problem that Rust is trying to solve is, effectively, who cleans up data? That's the biggest problem. There's other things you get to. But who cleans up data, right? So let's say that you're in uh, Python. You create an object. It's a database row, right? The question is, who cleans that up, right? Any Python programmers here? Know enough to answer that question? I think I know enough to garbage. Give it a crack. That's exactly right. So essentially, Python doesn't make an attempt to do anything intelligent. It does the dumbest thing you can do in the smartest way you can do it. It says, I'm not going to clean up any of this stuff. I'm just going to mark it as, as stale. Then at a specific point in time, your whole Python program shuts down. It's called the gel kicks in. And it goes through and it tries to reap all of the different objects that haven't been touched, that it feels aren't referenced, all of that. It has all different heuristics that tack that in when it runs. It's extremely complex. And it happens so fast that most people can write Python code and they're totally fine, right? But Rust is smarter about that, indistinguishably, just in a whole different class of its own. Rust doesn't need a garbage collector because something in Rust has to own that data. And when that data is no longer being used, that something can remove that data. There's a destroy method that gets called. There's this process of destruction. So anything that is not being owned is destroyed. And that's how Rust does it. And different languages accomplish this in different ways. So that is the whole premise of ownership, right? One person is responsible for owning the data, which means cleaning it up. And because of that, and because you can only have one person clean up the data, uh, there's a distinction between the guy who does the work and everyone else who just borrows it, who doesn't have to do that work, right? If I pass code, a block of code, a row from your database into a function, uh, that thing I'm passing it into doesn't have to clean it up, right? Unless it takes ownership of it. Otherwise, I have the ownership, I have to clean it up, right? When it's done with it, I still own it, I have to clean it up. And you can play with that analogy any different way you want. Uh, there's a very popular way of explaining it with coloring books. You know, there's a difference between, uh, you know, giving the coloring book to someone and then allowing a kid to use a coloring book. They can still do all the same things with it, mutate it and whatever. But if it's not their coloring book, ultimately, they don't get to decide whether to sell it or destroy it. Uh, I've seen that work relatively well. But the point is that understanding why this is there will help you get through it because it sucks. And you don't want to be wondering why it's there when you're struggling with it. So. 
There are two different concepts in Rust because we have this concept of ownership that are very prime in this language that other languages totally hide from you, right? And one of those is called the heap and the other one is called the stack. Does anyone know what the differences between these two things are? Anyone want to talk about that? Yeah. We can talk about why is this the stack lower level? But so is the heap. No, it could be shared between a bunch of functions. Well, I mean, they're, they're both blocks of memory. The reason why the stack is lower level is because the CPU actually has instruction sets that operate on the stack, right? So the CPU has a, an instruction set that tells it effectively you want to pop something off the stack. You want to grow the stack. You want to shrink the stack. It's got all these different instructions. It's based on a stack machine. So a stack kind of works like, and the comment that it, it grows the opposite direction is awkward, but it's definitely true. The stack grows from the top to the bottom, and the heap grows from the bottom to the top. And if you map out the memory, you'll see that. As you overflow the stack, it's growing down. As you overflow the heap, it grows up. Uh, but uh, effectively, you have these different methods of managing memory, and they work, they work in a different fashion. Uh, a stack works by, you get a block of memory, it's assigned to your function frame typically, and when you want to lose that block of memory, right, it's for your function frame, all you effectively do is you tell your CPU, right, set the stack pointer back up to the top and start over. It doesn't do anything with it. It just moves the pointer up to the top, right, pointer changes, and you're golden, right? When it comes to a heap, it's much more complex because you have fragmentation, you have different blocks of memory everywhere, and we get into some of that here. <clears throat> because the stack uh, is more, I would say, less, higher level, right? Uh, there are different operations that only work on the stack, that you only ever do on the stack. And one of them that's prime, where all this complexity will come, is a string, right? So a string has, in Rust, there's a notion of a pointer to the data, there's a notion of the length of the string, and then there's the third one, the capacity, right? And that is how big of the section that string is in the heap. When you overflow the capacity, you have a problem. You effectively have to move it somewhere else into a bigger section and you have a newer capacity, right? So this is very uh, in your face, kind of, in the Rust world, and we'll see some of that in a, in a minute. All right. So the ownership rule. Uh, every value in Rust has an owner. There can only be one owner at a time, and when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. Dropped is what I said, cleaned up, right? And that's useful because you don't ever have to memorize the ownership rule. That's just only what ownership means. So it's very reasonable. There is uh, variable scoping, right? And we'll talk about how that works. There's like a conceptual variable scope, and then there's how that works on the stack. Uh, here they're creating a variable uh, s and they're defining it to hello and they're saying this is a string literal, right? Now the thing about a literal is when they say a literal, they're referring to a string that you've already told it everything about, right? They say the string is, has a known size, right? And it doesn't grow. That's the definition of a literal. For a computer, there's a lot of different types of strings. This is a special type of string. And because you know everything about it, you can put it on the stack. You know the biggest it can ever be, right? And the smallest it can ever be. What's up? And the smallest it can ever be. And the smallest it can ever be, right? Uh, so you can see here how that scoping works. We say let s equals hello, and then we can say do stuff with x, and then we say the scope is over and s is no longer valid, right? Now there's implications on the stack too. When it enters that frame, it's going to say, I need to allocate these bytes on the stack for hello. And then when you're done, it could theoretically move the stack pointer back up and write something else there. Right? OK. Uh, the string type. So down here, we have something different. Now let's look at this. Let's examine these two things. We have s equals string from and then the literal. So we are constructing a string object with a literal. That's how we would say that that's worked. Right. We wouldn't actually say a string object, we would say a string type. But we're constructing a string from a literal. That's the key. The one above is not a constructed string, it is just a literal. 
So we have different words to describe these, even though they may look the same and act the same in other languages, right? And the rush string stuff, you know, there's going to be a lot of times where we gotta, you got to reread through some of this stuff and ask questions. But the point here is that this one down here, where you say string from hello, straight to the heap, right? And why does it go straight to the heap? Because suddenly it has a capacity. It can shrink. It can grow. You're not guaranteed to have no padding on that. Right? The way a computer works, it works in a set pointer size. Right? So you may have three bits of something, but a computer can't even address it. And you may have a stack that can only grow by a certain amount of bytes, eight bytes, 12 bytes, 40 bytes, whatever it is. So Rust can give that string more capacity than you actually have in the literal. Right? So there's actually a method to say, I don't want the padding in Rust. But I'm saying that padding can be there. That capacity, I want you to realize that that capacity is always there when you create a string uh, type from a literal. And here what we're doing is we say let mute s equal string from hello. So now we've declared that this string on the heap is mutable. right? Now this gives you effectively all of the power you'd have in Python. The only difference is s now owns it. So now there's some complexities around it. Right? And again, this is where I get into a lot of this easy stuff is a good way to get into this borrow checker and this concept of ownership. And it gets more complex. You know, this is why we take the class slow. Uh, S push string world. This is the way you can take a string and add something to it. You can push another string on top of it. I will say this is awkward for me that they do this. But this is how Rust works. And Rust doesn't want you. We call this concatenation, by the way. When you take one string and you add it to another string, we would say you concatenate them together. There's a lot of stuff going on in that operation, a lot of stuff, right? Let's say that you have five different things you want to concatenate together. You're in Perl. You write string A dot string 2 dot string 3, whatever. You're in Python, string A plus string 2 plus string 3. These are concatenation operators. They're taking those strings and they're putting them together for you. Uh, think about if you're processing that, right? You don't know how big the final string is. You don't even know that you have a final string. Because when you add two strings together, you get another string. You add another string to that, you get another string. You add another string to that, you get another string. Right? So all of these different operations, string plus string returns a string. If you got more stuff after that, another string, you add those two together, you return a string. What I'm getting at here is that there's a lot of middle steps to producing that last string. If you have a lot of different things you're concatenating together, you're going to have a lot of middle steps. So Rust makes this in your face ugly, right? Doesn't want you to do it. And they're showing you the method that would be insane if you did this, right? Which is this push string method. Uh, now, the question then should emerge, let's sneak ahead and cheat. What's the right way to do that in Rust? Use a, a macro called format. Rust is all about macros, right? There's a macro called format, and it gives you the ability to say, I want to take five strings and concatenate them. I want to put it together however I want. Effectively, format is just like print, except rather than sending the new thing you constructed to the screen, it's actually going to take it, build the type, and return it, right? So if you've ever seen, you've seen the print ln exclamation point, we have format exclamation point, same thing. Right? Except it's returning the type rather than putting it to your screen. All right. But yeah, if you see something like this and you come from Python, it's a little arcane to have to do s.pushString. Why don't we have an operator for it? The reason is because it is both slower and it does, uh, it does a lot more work. It, something has to own it when it returns it. Memory and allocation. Uh, so let's hit this part up. And what we have is, yeah, this is just getting, OK, this is, this is doing the same thing we just did. They're talking about the garbage collector in other languages. However, the second part is different. In languages with the garbage collector, see, I just picked on Python because that's how they do it. You could also pick on Java, by the way. But there are three people aren't even here today. So it's a little too easy. Uh, but yeah, other languages do this differently. and. There's nothing special there. We already went through that. 
variables and data in interacting with move. Okay. So we have this term we've introduced called ownership, right? The two ways in which you can interact with the ownership in Rust is to move and to borrow, right? Those are just the terms we use. You could think of a lot more terms with, you know, a uh, coloring book like give, but the Rust term is move and the Rust term is borrow. And how that works is very simple. We do that with an equal sign, right? So with an equal sign, we can say we want to move this value somewhere else, and it'll work like that. Uh, here we say S1 equals string from hello. We assign S2 to, we assign S1 to S2. We would say we have moved the value into S2. It's taken ownership of it. Uh, so is it a pointer or a copy? It is a fat pointer, because it's a string from, right? So a string, a string, so the question was, is it a pointer or a copy? And it, the answer is it's what we call a fat pointer. We kind of, we differentiate, especially when we're teaching it, it's very important to differentiate. You have a notion of a pointer, which is saying, I'm looking at this address in memory, right? And then you have a notion of a fat pointer, which tells you something more. I'm looking at this address in memory, but that address in memory, you're allowed to write 15 characters to, even though only 10 characters are currently written. So we have more things around a pointer in this case that you don't see in some other languages that don't have that. Back. On the important point is that there are certain types of static size that you would even think when you move them. And they actually, it's not really moving, it's actually creating a new problem. Right. Well, we'll get in that very shortly. There, there's a distinction here that we don't have to make yet, and we're not going to make it yet. Uh, I want to talk more about this concept of the, the pointer, right? So we, we kind of get an idea of why Rust is different. Why does Rust have this concept called a fat pointer? And other languages don't have it or need it, right? There are two common ways of representing strings in memory. If you have a string, like Evan, there's four letters, right? I can pass that around and I can tell you those four letters are my string. Right? Start at this address, and for four letters, you're going to have my name, Evan. Right? There is an alternative to that that other languages use. In this design, we would have to have the number four and a pointer. So we would have to have two things, two pieces of information. In other languages, they slay that dragon differently. They have just the pointer. And then you say, well, how do you know how long it is? Well, they have the other unit of information stored as a terminator at the end. That's very common, right? So the way C does it, which is gigantic, is you just point to the piece of memory, and then after your four characters, E-V-A-N, there's what they call a null character. And that's how C does it. So C, you just pass around pointers. Nothing knows how long anything is, and a string is defined as a piece of memory that ends in null. Now, the question you should ask is, what happens if the memory doesn't end in null? C explodes. Horrible. Every security vulnerability, the vast majority of them are around this notion of not knowing what you're pointing to. So this is a much safer way to do it. And to be clear, the null thing isn't free. It takes one byte. So you could just as easily tell it what the size of the string is, then you don't ever have to worry about it, right? And that's the way Rust is architected. So I want to get, I want to, I want to just make sure that we clarify the notion between a pointer and a fat pointer and why a fat pointer exists and why some languages don't have it and we're kind of unique. Uh, though not totally in that. All right. So the S1 and S2 component here, we see that they are both pointing to the same piece of data. And now we're going to get to what you're talking about. OK. So what the hell happened, right? Well, there is a notion of a copy, which copies the underlying data. And then there is the notion of a clone, which just makes it, uh, how would I say this? The problem with clone is that there is really no definition of it. It can do all kinds of crazy things. I would say this about clone. Clone is always guaranteed to be lighter than a copy. And uh, what's up? No, it could just be a fat pointer. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, a, it's always guaranteed to be lighter than a copy. 
And uh, I would say also it's a, it will always guarantee to work the same way unless it doesn't work at all. And you'll see that happen sometimes too. You'll see some areas where cloning data just simply won't work at all. And there are limitations to that, right? So uh, here what we're doing is we have a string and that string says hello in memory. There's a piece of memory somewhere that says hello. And we have this thing called S1 and it's pointing to that piece of memory, right? So S1 is a string type and it's pointing to a piece of memory that says hello. We clone S1. We don't actually have to copy the bytes that are in hello. We can leave them there and say, I just want to point to the same thing. Now you have two pieces of data, right? And they can work effectively just fine, right? Uh, so this is what it looks like to say, you know, S1 equals uh, S2.clone. Okay. Now here's what it looks like to say uh, S1 equals S2.copy, right? Now we have copied the string entirely. So now we have pointer length and capacity and we have duplicated them all together. And this is very insanely slow. Anyone know a language that does this? C++, that's why a lot of people say Python is faster. And C++, um, all, I believe all assignments are, are copy. So they all happen like this. And then that's safe, but it's, it's extremely slow and bloated. And what we're looking at here is two different ways to do this. So if we say S2 equals S1, and we want to do the intelligent thing, we clone it. If we want to say S2 equals S1, and we want to do the stupid thing, we can copy it. And they're just showing you that different languages have different semantics with regards to this. And this is a gigantic reason why Python and all these different dynamic languages became very popular, because you never have to worry about it. And on stuff like that, they just, they have real performance advantages over, over just copying everything. All right. Uh, so here we have a string from hello. We're creating it from, what do we call the hello on the inside? Does anyone remember the term that I used? String literal, right. And what do we call this? String constructor is fine. That's fine. I actually like that a lot. That's probably the term that I would use. But we're making a string type. This is, we're, we're creating a string type using, uh, using a, the from constructor. That's all fine. All right. So we are uh, setting S2 equal to S1. And then we're printing out. Now look at what we're printing out. We're printing out S1, right? So is that going to work? No. Why? Because you've moved the data from S1 into S2. Can you say S2 is a clone? Uh, no, you wouldn't say that here because it doesn't compile. It doesn't make sense to use a word in something that doesn't compile. You could do S2 equals S1.clone and actually clone it. But this doesn't actually compile, right? What's up? Yes, yes. I'm trying to think. Yeah, you, yeah. You're just thinking with that. Uh, cool. You can give the ownership back. Yes, that's where we're going to go. And there are other things you can do too. But let, let's just stick with this. Yes, you would say it's a move and you can no longer access S1. Keeping it as simple as you said and not entertaining, you know, more complex situations. What you said is totally fine. Okay. Uh, S1 and S2. So S1 and S2 both in this case point to the same piece of data and it says uh, this solves our problem, right? Because now we're not actually uh, moving the underlying value. We are cloning the underlying value, right? Well, to get what they're showing down here in figure 4.4, yes, that'll work. Uh, so which one would be the reference? Like the read-only reference, the second one? Or, or are they both? They would both be the read-only reference. They could only both be the read-only reference. Because you can only ever have one mutable reference or one or more immutable references. Right? So that was actually something we covered in the last class. And I'll say that again, just in case someone didn't catch that. With Rust, you can only have one mutable way to access data. Or, or you can have one or more immutable ways to access data. 
So if you declare something as immutable, you can have a lot of them. And the example that I gave you of why this is useful is, if you have a piece of data and you're running lots of, you know, you kids like the GPUs these days, but whatever, you're, you're, you have lots of different things that want to access that data. If that data is read only, you can have everything accessed at the same time, you don't care because they're not actually changing that data. They may return something new, they may not return anything at all, you're totally fine. That's a useful thing for a computer to have. A concept of immutability means you can make your, your applications parallel and have different concurrent things accessing it at the same time, and you don't have to worry about any race conditions. The second you have one thing that's mutable that accesses it, all those assumptions go out, uh, you know, out the window. And that's why the notion of building these abstractions around how the computer actually works, it, it works so well with Rust. Rust takes the machine and it says, how do we model what the machine needs in a language? A lot of other programs like Haskell take mathematician ideas and they say, how do I make a computer behave like that? They're working at the problem on the opposite angle. Rust emerges from engineering constraints and these other languages emerge from philosophy and, you know, geek stuff. Uh, I mean, it's all geek stuff, but things that don't exist. Uh, all right. So variables and data interacting with clone. So here we're going to see this again. So the question is, how do we get this, right? And let's go up here. Let's talk about this string from hello, S2 equals S1. The question is, what's happening there? I said I wouldn't call it cloning. I wouldn't call it cloning because it doesn't compile. If you want it to compile, you would clone it. What would that look like? It would look just like this right here. I'll make it a little bigger. So now we have string from hello, and I say s2 equals s1.clone. Now you've cloned it. You haven't copied the string. So you've only made that fat pointer, right? You've only copied that fat pointer. How big is that fat pointer? It's pretty damn small, you know, really small, minusculely small. It's important to go over that. We use an adjective fat because it's bigger than a regular pointer and because we like to body shame pointers. But if you talk about another language, right, like Perl, Perl the smallest thing you can carry in Perl is 36 bytes. A Rust fat pointer is like three bytes, you know? Well, a little bit more than that. 64-bit pointer, uh, eight, let's say, let's say 10 bytes, right? 10 bytes, I think, is like the smallest Rust fat pointer. So substantially smaller, right? A pointer in memory plus a capacity and a length. All right. Uh, Stack-only data, copy, and... Here we have, yes, okay. So here's the thing about cloning and copying, right? I'll tie this into exactly what I just said. A fat pointer is, what was the words we used? Not fat, but bigger than a regular pointer, right? Now, not everything needs to have a pointer at all, right? Some things can just exist as bytes in memory that Rust knows where they're at. It passes them around. Uh, and here's a case where that happens. In this case, we have a piece of memory on the stack which stores the value 5. Just the value 5. Now that could be in a different, we went over the integers yesterday, right? We covered them in the fundamentals, right? So an integer is these multiples of bytes, 8, 16, 32, 64. These, are, these can be different sizes of integers, Rust supports. And if you want to copy x and it's equal to 5, you could just be copying 8 bytes. That is smaller than the fat pointer, right? Uh, that's if it's an 8-byte integer, which is 64 bits. It could just be 1 byte, you know? There's, so in some cases, you don't even need to do any of this stuff, right? And in these cases, Rust does something that is very simple, very convenient, and people make it, they want to make it a habit. That's their inclination. It solves all the problems. I want to make it a habit. And that is, if you don't need any of this complexity, because it's faster and better without it, just copy the data. Rust does it for you. Right? Now, this is a real clever trick. And it can get you into a lot of trouble, because it can make you lazy. It can give you a way to not learn the language. And then you're not taking real advantage of your tools you're still probably faster than Python and Java, for what it's worth. But you have this here, let x equals 5, let y equals x. If 5 was a string, you would have a problem with that. It wouldn't compile like the last one didn't. You would have to say, 
uh, let y equals x dot clone. But because it's just an integer, we would say it's a primitive, you can just copy that into a new location. And in fact, copying the bytes for the five is faster than putting it in memory and copying a fat pointer, or copying the whole fat pointer. It's faster than both of those operations. So Rust does that for you, and it doesn't add any, any more complexity. That's a gift, but it gives you a way out. Because then you can just say, why doesn't everything implement copy? You know, why don't I just create a new type that implements copy for string? And then you just copy them everywhere, you know? There's all kinds of stupid tricks like that that people get themselves into. All right. So uh, ownership and functions. We kind of hit on this one earlier. Uh, I believe Brian was asking the question. I'm not 100% sure. But the question is, when you take ownership of something, right, how do you then go and use it elsewhere? And the answer to that is you simply give it back. And functions do that all the time. So if a function takes ownership of something and it doesn't give it back, what do you think happens? Destroyed. It's destroyed. It's very simple. And it's actually beautiful. So think about it like this. If I give someone my coloring book and they cannot give it back to me, for my purposes, it's gone. It's them, theirs to do whatever they want. And if they're never going to give it back, Rust figures that out and it just destroys it. It says no one else is going to have access to it. The function's done. So that's getting destroyed. It's getting cleaned up. Here's an example where we're doing that. We have this let s equal string from hello. And then we created a function called take ownership. And take ownership is taking ownership of that s. s is being, what's the term we used? What's the short word of taking ownership? Moved. s is being moved to the function called take ownership. Now, this is beautiful in Rust. This is what I like. Take ownership in this context is effectively destroy. That's what it's doing. It's a function that has taken the ownership away and doesn't have any method of giving it back. That is your implementation of destroy. Rust will figure the rest out. You've told Rust, I'm done owning it. That function had it, and now the function's done owning it, and now you know what to do. And that's what Rust is doing when you're compiling code saying, uh, this is no longer going to be owned, so let's destroy it. And that all happens. The places in which code gets destroyed get determined in compilation time by that. So you don't ever have to do this stuff in runtime. Rust figures out all of this stuff in compilation time. All right. Uh, return values and scopes. Uh, so here's an example of this. <clears throat> Let s1 equals give ownership. So now we have a function. That is called give ownership down here. And what is give ownership returning? It's returning a string, right? So it's giving you something. It's giving you the coloring book, right? And S1 now owns the result of that thing it returned, right? So we would say that give ownership creates this thing called some, some string. And what happens to it? What's the Rust word for the next part of that sequence? Huh? It moves it to S1. It moves it to S1, exactly. Exactly. Precisely. Give ownership has created this thing. It's given you ownership, and you have moved it to S1. That's where it resides now. And now whose job is it to clean it up? S1, yours. Exactly. S1, yours, main, because main is the function name. All of those things are correct. Right? And that's what I want you to kind of see. That's the story behind it. That's why you're playing the game. Right? You're playing the game because main, S1, it's now their job to clean it up. The function is out of the picture, right? All right. S3 is slightly different now. Why? Why is S3 different? What is S3 doing? You are doing what? You're moving ownership into the function, but then returning it to give it back. Yes, exactly. You're moving S2 into the function, and then the function is giving it back to you. It's moving back, and you're storing it now in S3. So S3 now owns S2. Very simple. That did nothing, right? S3 owns S2. All right. I can say S3 goes S2? Uh, no. S2 would, would move 
the value into the function and then it moves the value into S3. Oh, so S2 is no longer valid. So you, you always have to give it to a function first? No, you, no. Could, you could clone it, you know. No, but what's, I mean, it's supposed to be to move over to just give, give it to a function. And you, you, you change ownership every time you write equals, right? Uh, no, that wouldn't that wouldn't come. So I think what you mean is that because the function is doing nothing, it would be equivalent. The yes, it's the equivalent. Else, it yeah, that's the identity function. Well, you just remove the identity function. That that is effectively the identity function. You could call it that. That is the identity function. Yes. But you can't. But you always need an identity function to do the sign. No. So if you no. did, if you remove the identity function here, sure. Here. Sure. Just bypass that and just do Yeah. Okay, so let's come down here. Cargo new, uh, bin. And then, hello, uh, we'll say here ownership. Boop. Ownership. Vim source, main. Now I'm going to paste this code in here. Cargo run. Runs. Okay, now the question is. Can I write this? By the way, these coloring schemes are horrible. How can you guys look at that? You can't even read that S3. Now watch this. I'm going to install a better coloring scheme. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, now it's vibrant. It's it's still barely look at that. That's, that's crystal clear. Totally crystal right clear. All right. Uh, can you, can you, can you yeah, here. Oh, there we go. Oh. I can't type on a on a on a slant. There we go. Okay, so let's run this now, and we run it. So S two is moved into S three. We're golden. It's moving it. So the problem we were having in the last one is let's take a look at this. Let's bookmark this. Let's come back. We were here. Okay. So this one didn't work, not because we didn't do clone, but because we referenced S1 afterward. That's the reason why, right? So this is the same. You can move ownership with the equal sign, but then you can't reference the older copy. If you need to reference the older copy, you need to clone it. So this example didn't work because we didn't clone it. So I should be more careful, because I assume that we're all building on the same example. It's because of lockdown. The moment you try to reference it again, the lifetime gets extended to that form. Right? It's not an identity function. It's actually a clone function. So it's not a clone function. It's a move. That's it. It's just moving the value. No, yeah. I mean, the take, take and give back the sign. Oh, it is, it is. It is an identity. It's not doing anything. Here, you could even just call it this. Look here. We could just say here ID, right? And you would just say here. Like that, right? Now you would agree it's an identity function. Now you just come down here, S2 equals. An, an identity function is just a function that gives you the same thing back. It just returns you the same thing. Uh, there you go. Does nothing. So I'm just saying the reason why this example works and the other one doesn't is because I didn't read it. And the other example that we had, I thought we were building on, had that print in there. And the print made it to where it didn't work. And they cut that out of this example. OK? So the answer is you can do it simply with an equal sign. Uh, and that works in this case because we're not using the value again. All right. OK. Return value. We did this. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Question. Yeah. I'm having a hard time making sense of what is happening to like S1 after you know, it gets invalidated and now S2 takes ownership. So at some point, let's say S1 goes out of scope and gets uh, the memory, right, of S1 gets cleared up. Now, S1 holds a pointer, right? It holds a pointer just to the data that S2 is now taking ownership of. S1 holds a fat pointer to the data. It's in the it has a land, it has a, it holds two ends and a pointer to the memory, right? When it gets uh, clean, when the, um, no, it's not really. function gets called on it. When it's moved, it's just marked as, as, as unusable. It, it's, but what, what happens to the point? 
Oh, wait. The in S2 is in S2. The, the, yes. The, that's correct. It's the same piece of memory the whole time. Ownership is a semantic that doesn't actually exist in the binary. It only exists in the Rust compiler. When you compile Rust code, there is no longer a concept of ownership. It only exists to annoy you to make sure it can compile the code and be sound. It's like a prover. It's, it's, not, it's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. You're telling Rust, here's what I'm trying to do. And Rust is telling you, yes, that makes sense, or no, you're an idiot. Rust's behavior doesn't change on lifetimes. It's describing something to your, it's, a, it's an explicit contract with it. And then when Rust produces an executable, a binary you can run, no more concept of ownership exists. It all goes away. So when we say the ownership is changing, we're talking about an abstraction for us as programmers, right? In this case, the function has given S1 this concept of ownership, meaning now the function will no longer clean up its own mess it made. S1, or the thing that owns S1, is going to clean that up. Uh, then what we do is we say S2 equals a new string, right below it, it's unrelated, and then we say S3 equals S2, right? We're showing you that we can pass around these blocks of memory uh, and change their ownership. Can I ask a different question? Sure. Is there any chance that it's not available? Uh, are you familiar with C++ pointers? Well, C++ has a lot of different types of pointers, too. You know? Is there any chance this is not available with pointers? Is this a small pointer? Uh, this is certainly. Uh, I won't say it's a pointer. It's just okay, a, is this replicable? That's it, my question. It's a string it's container, replicable. actually. No, it's not a string container. It's a str well, it's equivalent to a C structure so, for a group of strings. Yes, it is. C struct that contains a pointer to the actual data. But in the sense that like everything in C could be a C struct. So yeah. <laughs> so it's not, it's not so copying the pointer, it's copying the So basically when you assign S2 to S3, S2 ceases to exist, my understanding. Unless you use the clone function. Sorry, I was asking about the earlier example of S1. Yeah, he's asking about the, the top, line two. S1 equals uh, give ownership. I'm saying in gives ownership example, right, what is happening there is and let's come down here to look at the, the, the code is right down here, right? Give ownership is creating this piece of memory on the heap on line five. It's saying, go to the heap, build a piece of memory with the string literal called yours. I'm asking about the other example where we said S1 is equal to a string from, and then we said S2 is equal to S1. I'm sorry, that's, where's that in the, this is, this is the line? He's asking about the first example. Yeah, and then you try to print the S1 and it fails. Yeah. Oh, okay. You, I thought you were okay. So you're talking about this code here. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. We're yeah. Yeah. Shout out to me the second you see this stuff, so we don't spend the time to find it again. It's uh, this one right here, right? This is what you're talking about. Okay. So you wonder what's happening here. So S1 is saying, go to the heap, store this string literal, which we know the size of, right? Uh, in this type called a string, right? That's going to add to it a capacity, right, that the literal doesn't have. So now we have this fat pointer to this piece of memory on the heap. So S1 is effectively a fat pointer that owns a piece of memory on the heap. You getting that? Yeah. S1's a fat pointer that owns a piece of memory on the heap, and then we're saying let S2 equals S1. So now we're taking that fat pointer, and I am copying that fat pointer. So I have another one. But the thing is that now we have two different fat pointers that are supposed to own the same piece of memory, right? The problem is that can't happen, because equal does the move. So Rust errors out, and it says you can't print the first one, S1, because it no longer owns the, that, that part of that, that piece of data, right? Here's the actual error. Move occurs because S1 has type string, which does not implement the copy trait, right? So it, it's effectively saying we can't do that. I understand all of that. Now the function is over. It goes out of scope, and you want to clean it. So you clean the struct itself and what it points to. But if you clean it both times, can you tell me if it's reference code? It is not reference counted. It's not reference counted. 100% not reference counted. 
the fat pointer goes out of scope. And when the fat pointer goes out of scope, in the destruct for the fat pointer, it frees the memory it's pointing to. Not reference counted. No. S1 is not getting destroyed because the data that S1 is pointing to on the heap, right, is still being used. You have moved it to S2. So because you've moved it to S2, the data underneath it cannot be destroyed. S1 just simply, it, it, it can't own that data, right? So it's, it's weird because what I'm doing is I'm trying to explain a compilation error. And I'm telling you why it's failing, right? It's failing because these things aren't possible, just to be clear, you know? It's failing because you can't access S1 after you've moved it. So I'm telling you why it's not working, right? Not why it is working. It is not working because S1, at the point that you print that line, no longer owns that data. You've moved it out. S1 doesn't have it. It doesn't exist in the real world because this doesn't compile. That's a hard question to ask, right? Like, it's confusing. You say S1 doesn't have the data because S1 doesn't exist, and I'm like, well, the program doesn't compile. Why doesn't the program compile? Because S1 doesn't have the data, you know? The program doesn't compile because S1 doesn't exist with that data anymore. So there's, there's no program in which S1 has the data or doesn't have the data because it's unsound and the program can't even compile. What is the state of S1 if instead of referencing S1 in that print, you reference S2? So you, you're, you're printing the contents of S2. What happens to S1? OK, now that is a good question, because in this case, it would work. So what would happen with S1 is that the compiler would know that that code is no longer accessible by the name of S1 because it's been moved, and it would just work. That's totally valid. But you can't go back and say, I want to access that data by a different name. Because now you have a problem. You moved it, right? You didn't copy it. You didn't clone it. You moved it. Yeah, so I think the answer to this question is, is basically if you go to figure four tree, right below, there's a paragraph that says, to ensure memory safety after the line left S2 equals S1, Ross considers S1 to be no longer valid. Right. Yeah. So he considers no longer valid, and S2 is the one that has to Drop whatever goes on the That's Yeah. Yeah, here's where he's showing this right here. This is what you're showing right here? No, figure four dash three. Yeah, but the uh if you go down there, that paragraph the second one. Oh, you're going uh the very top one. Yeah, to ensure memory safety. Yeah. S2 equals S1. Rust considers S1 is no longer valid. Therefore, Rust doesn't need to free anything when S1 goes out of scope. Check out what happens when you try to use S1 after S2 is created. OK, so that's, that is the right way to say it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, effectively, what we're saying is, does, S1, does the data from S1 get freed? No, because something is still pointing to it. But S1 is not valid, right? And that's, I think that's kind of how we answered that question, so it's right? Effectively like it drop it, but it's still there. not at all. That's totally wrong. So no. If you drop it, it's cleaned up. What they're telling you here is that S1 is not dropped. The data from S1 is moved, and it's owned by S2. It was dropped. But I meant the fat pointer thing. The fat pointer is the same. It's the same fat pointer. So why would it be valid? Because you didn't clone it explicitly. You could imagine a language that just implicitly cloned fat pointers, but that's not Rust. So it moves. S equals is the move semantic. Clone is a different semantic, right? Does it actually move the memory, or basically you're just renaming S1? OK. Just the reference. This is why I don't like the word move. <laughs> you're not moving the memory. Okay, good. So you, what you're doing is changing the name of the variable. Change that. Go. You're, precisely. Yes, exactly. Say? say it again. <laughs> say it again, Alex. Changing the ownership. Exactly. You're changing the ownership, right? So move in the Rust world is changing ownership. 
Let's be absolutely clear about this. When you think move, do not think copying bytes. When you hear move, you mean changing ownership. Mm -hmm. Totally different things. Yes? Is this basically like move in the file system? No. Mm. no. Not at all. Well, I mean, it's yeah. not totally wrong. I don't think it would yeah, it is. Yeah. It's like rename. Yeah, it is kind of it is kind of like it is in a file system. The data on the disk, you just move the move the link. Yeah, you have the same inode in two different places. I actually don't hate that analogy. I think it's 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 fine at the level we're at. It falls apart later, but it's totally good at the level we're at. So yes, it is kind of like that. You can think of it like that. Uh, so I guess what confuses me is that they say when we assign this one to a string, the string data is copied in the copy. So you're copying the pointer. That's what they're saying. That's kind of what's confusing. So if you're copying the point, then why would the phrase not be coming back? The, the, the only thing that I can like, tell you is it, because. It's by design for concurrency. It's by design for concurrency. Yes, for concurrency. of course. If the, the, you have two, I have two threads and they both have the same, and they, and, and they both have the same access to the same pointer, and they both try to destroy at the same time, and you're going to have issues. Dot clone the, the is purpose, something. The purpose is all, so when you have many threads accessing this thing, only one thread can destroy it. There's a lot of different reasons why that's the case, right? Uh, let me explain to you one that's very simple. You want equal to be dot clone, right? That's where you're coming from. You're saying, I imagine a Rust, but why isn't Rust using equal for dot clone? I'm not saying that I want it to be dot clone. I'm just asking why would you create a copy of the point instead of that's exactly what you're doing. You're renaming yeah. the pointer. That's you're it. copying the pointer. Not copying the actual. It, it, so it, it's difficult because this is where it gets down to like what is actually happening in the compiler. In which case, he's totally right. The compiler is not actually going to copy the pointer. Versus how you can think about it when you're reading the code, right? I, we've already had that talk. I told you that at a high level, we're talking about how this makes sense to uh, uh, how this makes a sound program. But Rust can optimize all kinds of things like that out. You can think you're copying the pointer and not copying the data and make sense out of that. Is Rust actually going to copy the pointer? No, it's not. You can think of it like that, but come. Bro. You want to argue with me or Godbolt? I don't care. Pull it up in Godbolt. You know how to use Godbolt. You're a smart guy. And prove me wrong. If you can, I'm, I don't care what's there. I'm just telling you, you know? But you want me to argue like I wrote the text. I didn't write the text. I'm just explaining it to you. I'm saying there's, there's the way that you can reason about a program, right? You can say it's copying the pointer. It's not copying the underlying data. That's totally fine because it will make sense to you and you can reason about the program. Then you can raise a critique, why would Rust copy the pointer? And the answer is simply, it won't. If you compile that code with the release flag, right, it's production code, you tell Rust I want to compile this with the optimizations, it's not going to copy the pointer. It's not going to do anything. All that's going to get optimized out in any language. Uh, that's because compilers are insanely smart. And if we were to explain things based on what the compiler did, no one here would get anything. So the only way I can explain to you what this code does is if I tell you it's being stupider than it actually is. And you're right to say, why would the compiler be doing something so stupid? The answer is it's not. If this was to get into the complexities of the Rust compiler, it would be game over on chapter four, right? You understand like compiler optimizations at a very high level what I'm, what I'm talking about? Okay, so at a very high level, compiler optimizations break everything we're reading. They don't respect anything about it. The only thing this tells you is, if it worked this way, you would get the same effect when you ran it. Everything else gets changed when it gets compiled. So it's a different world, you know? They're trying to create a differentiation here between copying a pointer, a fat pointer, and the data on the heap. That's the important thing to take away. And that's the important thing to take away because we have two different traits that are everywhere in Rust and we need to learn how to use them. One of them is the copy trait, where we're actually copying the bytes in memory. And the other one is the clone trait, where we're just copying the pointer to it. 
And that's what the book is trying to teach at this point, not what Rust is doing in compilation. OK? But if you're interested in that compilation talk and we can geek out about it, check out Godbolt, and we'll look at it, right? All right. We're at the end of this one. So uh, I think we are here. Source main. And we have let S1 equals string from hello. And then we have S2 length equals calculate length S1. And we are now printing. The length of the string is the length, right? Now this is somewhat cool. We're seeing how we can just put multiple variables in there. This is the same format you could use if you wanted to return that as a string. You would just replace println equals format, and that whole thing is going to get returned to you as a new string. So that syntax for building these format strings and filling them up works the same way for printing it out as format. And uh, all they're showing you here is that in some languages you can return multiple values, multiple return things, variables. Uh, Rust has no concept like that. Everything in Rust returns one thing. Here, main is returning nothing. It's, a, it's, it's empty. Here below, calculate length is returning a tuple, which is one thing. The tuple is one thing. Inside the tuple, there are two things. That tuple is typed where the first thing that it's returning is right here, a string and a u size. So it's showing you that tuple is strongly typed. That's the type of it. That's what's getting returned. OK? And boom, we are done with ownership 4.1. OK. References and borrowing. By the way, this, this is going to get worse. And then <laughs> I'm just saying, this is going to get worse. This is, this is not actually that bad, but it, it, it's, this is going to be worse than the last one. And then uh, five, I think we're going to blow through because it's, it's substantially easier. All right. Uh, references and borrowing. So now we get into what does borrowing mean, right? So far, we've talked about moving. We move with the equal sign. Uh, now we're going to get into how do references work. We, we set here, let s1 equal string from hello. We're giving it what is from here. What's the right word for from? Literal, right? We're saying let length equals calculate length, and we're giving it a reference. This is the new piece of semantics that we're getting. And then we're saying the length of the string is string, s1 length. Now, here is the catch. Why this is new to us is if s1 was being given to length, right, we were moving s1 into calculate length, you would no longer have access to it in the print line statement. Now we're showing you how you can work around that. That means when you're thinking about all this stuff, you need to be thinking about, what do I want to do with this code afterward? Who do I want to own it and clean it up? In this case, even though we are allowing calculate length to borrow S1, it is not going to clean it up. We're going to clean it up. And we know that because we didn't move it into calculate length. So we still own it. We still have it. When that thing is done with it, it's still ours. It's going to give it back, and we can do whatever we want with it. That's what we're saying. If S1 was declared as mutable, would calculate length be able to be mutated? Yes. But you'd have to declare this as mute pointer to S1, and you'd have to declare this down here as a mutable pointer to the string. Yes. But yeah. What's up? Yeah, yeah, wow. definitely. Yeah, think of it like that. It, it, it is definitely, that's why I started this off with saying this is why we're struggling like this, right? Because you know what a pain in the ass it is if you have kids or you know how they work, and now you're the kid. So it sucks. Uh, OK, uh, it takes a little, bit, a little bit of time getting used to. And Rust is the unrelenting parent. There is no way to work around it. You can't ever say, chill, I'll do it later. You know, <laughs> It will give you nothing. Uh, it is unforgiving. OK, so. Here we have uh, S1, uh, S, S1, and data. The data, right, is the hello thing. That is going to be on uh, the heap after we create the string type. Good thing I caught that. OK, someone would have got that. We are providing the, sh the from constructor for the string type, the string literal hello, right? 
So what that means is eventually it's going to get to the heap, right? And when it gets to the heap, we're storing this data in the heap hello, and we have a fat pointer that now owns it. That is S1. S1 has the pointer to the piece of memory, the length, and the capacity. Can't add any more characters to this, it's five. It's at its limit. Then we have a new pointer, which we call in Rust a slice, and all it has is the pointer to the, the fat pointer. So we have that, and we're looking at what that looks like here. So S1 is right here, and we're passing to it, right, a pointer to the fat pointer. That's what it looks like to borrow. So we're not passing S1 into calculate length, we're passing a pointer to it in, right? And now it's going to tell us the opposite of referencing by using the ampersand is dereferencing, which is accomplished by using the D. Yeah, we're not, we're not, they're not actually showing this just there, so ignore this for now. And by the way, Russ will tell you it's really good about that. This little note in the blue, it's very important later on. We're not going to fixate on it now, but Rust is a great language in the sense that it always knows when you need to dereference things. It'll straight up come and say, you forgot the ampersand or something. You forgot the asterisk. It'll tell you exactly what you forgot. And it's very clever about that. Not like C, where if you've ever done C, you kind of, sometimes you just guess and you just smash on, you know, asterisk until it gives you what you want. And then you publish it and you wait for someone to find security vulnerabilities. <laughs> Russ is very explicit, you know. Uh, okay. Let's take a closer look at the function call here. Uh, let s1 equals string colon colon from hello, and then let length equals calculate length s1, and we're giving it a borrowed copy, not the actual copy. We're not moving. Calculate length takes this reference to string and it's returning a U size. Right, this is going to be a U size is the architecture's most efficient type. So you don't have to specify how many bytes it is, but there's this concept of the architecture size, you know. I think it's kind of a little vague, but whatever, you can use it. Uh, and that's the length. Okay. Uh, function main. This doesn't compile, right? Let s equals string from hello, and we're changing it, and we're giving it a reference to change. And this doesn't work because you can't push onto an immutable reference. That thing we saw earlier with push string requires mutability. If you try to pass an immutable reference to something that is wanting to do push string, Rust panics. It says, I can't do that from this, this standpoint I'm at. And this is the error. Let's take some time to read this error because it's not important, but I just want you to show this is how good Rust is going to be at telling you you're stupid. So if this doesn't make sense to you, no, Rust will, at least for all the beginner stuff, hold your hand through it and tell you why you're doing it wrong. You can learn a lot by doing this, right? So if this sounds complex, it is, and you're going to screw it up all the time, and Rust will make sure you're doing it right at the end. And that's it. You're, you just, you, you got to bash your head against it a bunch. That would totally work. It would totally work, but like, would it, would it free the original value? No, but the original value would go to scope immediately afterward anyway, because it's not being used. Oh, yeah. You know, so it would be, you know, probably get compiled the same. You could, you know, uh, what's up? If you were to make S mutable in the original scope, you would have to make every reference to it mutable, correct? If you're going to make S mutable in the original scope. Or mutable, should I say? Say it one more time. Mutable. If you make if you have a mutable string, you can only ever have one reference. Zero mutable references, one mutable reference. So, so mutability means you can only have one reference to it. Yes, but that, would, that, you would, would you have to put mutable for that reference, or would it would just be yes. mutable? No, you always have to carry around mute everywhere. It doesn't ever go away. It's always in your face. All right, mutable references. Here we go. Here's what you're, you're just a couple lines down. So. Uh, function main, let mute s equals string, oh, yes, I know. Uh, oh, look at that, I went to a whole other page. Boom. Oh, did I just, there we go, no? Okay. There we go. Okay, back to where we're at. So, uh, function main, 
let mute s equal string from hello, and we're saying change uh, here, and now we're giving it the mutable reference. So pay attention. There's your mute, right? It never goes away. So it's provided here. You have to declare the type as mute, and then you have to declare the reference as mute. And it doesn't make a difference how many times you use it. You always have to say, this is a mutable reference. Every, every single time. Every single time. Yes. And it's not actually that bad because it's three characters. <laughs> Grow up. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, you're saying, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, what's up? So what if you passed in to a different function, uh, ampersand mute s, like right below, and have both of them spawn threads and do something, you're going to get into a race position, right? Will it not let you do that? No, it will not let you do that. No, and, it, and it's actually interesting because Rust is smart enough to know when you're spawning threads, and it has a whole different list of primitives for it. And we're going to cover them all in a much later chapter. And that's one of the reasons why this is really nice, because these same types of things where Rust is being a pain in the ass about who owns what, they apply directly to things that come at a future point called like sync and send. So sync and send are the parallel uh, equivalents in complexity, right? Uh, okay. So what we have here is we're providing change the mutable copy, and now everything works. We come down here, and everything doesn't work. What did we change? We said let mute s equals string from hello, and then we say r1 equals the mutable uh, reference to s, which is a mutable string. That's good. Let r2 equals the mutable reference to s. What is the rule? You can only have one mutable reference to it. A... can only have one mutable reference. That's not going to work. You can't have multiple. You can't throw two in there. All right, and it tells you right here. The only reason why I'm showing these error messages is because I want you to know that as, as shitty as this stuff is, it will literally tell you exactly why you suck. So here's the, it says the first mutable borrow occurs here. It's telling you where the first one was, and then it tells you, and you, then you pull the second one right here. That's nice. In most languages like Perl, it only tells you the first time you fucked up that it found. Then it throws up its hand and says, I don't know what's going on. So you always, when you're running a language like Perl or Python, you iteratively work from the first screw up it found to the second one. With Rust, it can go on. That compiler can examine the whole program and give you a whole report of everywhere you screwed up or what all you're missing. You know? Like if you have a match statement and you're missing one case, sometimes it'll tell you the other three cases you're missing too. It went and processed them and figured it all out. You know, it's, it's pretty bizarre, but very good. Yes? So if you remove R1 from the plane, then you right? Say it again louder. No. 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 Doesn't matter. No. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter. I don't think this matters. The answer to your question is simply no. If we take this here, I'll show you. Well, wait. Wait, you're saying if I remove R1, yeah. will this still work? The R1 will own the mutable copy to S. Yes, it will work. Yes, it will work. OK. Who wants to take a crack at why it'll work? You, do you know why it'll work? OK, why? Because then the lifetime of R1 is before you reassign to R2. Exactly. Yes. Yes. The fact that they're not going into that means I don't really want to go into it either. But that is exactly the right reason. Right? And we'll cover that shortly. And one of the big reasons is that's a Rust 2018 change that allows you to do that. It's line by line lifetimes, right? Uh, but yes, that's exactly what would happen. So very attentive and good catch and good question. Uh, all right. Let's go here. See, so here, here we're introducing scopes, but we're not doing line scopes yet. And this is like the older version of doing it. So uh, we say let mute s equals string from hello. And then we say let r1 equals mute s. And then we're saying r1 goes out of scope here. And then we have let r2 equals mute s. So now we have exactly what you're talking about. We're just not showing the line number thing yet. right? But this is exactly how you can think about it. So his question was, if we go up here, why does this, th he said, if we don't have the print, will this work? right? And the answer to that is yes. And now I think we're going to approach why. If we come down here and we look at this, if it was written like this, it would be very clear why it would work. Because we have an explicit brace that creates a scope, uh, which we can then scope that, that ownership into. 
And when the braces are done, that scope is out, uh, R1 no longer needs to have the mutable copy of S. So because R1 no longer needs the mutable reference, something else can have a mutable reference. So the key is, Rust says you can't have multiple mutable references that exist at the same time. If by at the same time, do you mean in the same scope? Yes, but here's the thing. There's implicit scoping, and we're going to get into that. So a line can satisfy its own scope, right? You can just imagine every line is covered with its own braces, and that kind of uh, will do the similar thing. Yes? Okay, so the way that I understand it, that the Rust compiler is smart enough to know that since you're not using R1 anymore, right. drop that there, and then you can have a new scope. Yeah. So, so yes. if you were to put the R2, uh, you know, readable, uh, what's it called, reference before R1, would that be a compiler error or no? Uh, yes. It would because R2 exists while the other scope was well, 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 no, not even in that case. Now, if you used it after the scope, it would be a compiler error. Because if you're not using the reference, Rust is free to release it right away. Oh, That's I, the key here I that we're missing. Declare it before the, uh, scope. I'm saying if you declared it up here, you said let R2 equals mute S. Because you're never using R2 again, Rust can immediately free it. What if you do use it, uh, if you use it later, though? It will be an error. Yes, then okay. you've got your error. That's exactly right. That's your question. So you've got to be a little more careful about it. Got but that's, that's exactly right. You got it. OK, now here we have let mute s equals string from hello. We have let r1 equals the reference to s. No problem. No problem. Why? Because they're not mutable. You can have as many immutable references as you want. So both of these are not a problem. Create references all day long, as long as none of them are mutable. Down here, big problem. Big problem, you've created a mutable reference. And when you, you can only have one mutable references or any amount of immutable references. It doesn't matter which way you slice that. You create the immutable ones first, and the immutable one, error. Mutable one, then the immutable ones, error. It just won't work. So that's it. And so that has got a scope first, and then you can make immutables. So if you have a mutable one, then that goes out of scope, you can make an infinite amount of immutable ones? Yes. OK. Yeah. Because they can't exist at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason, to be clear, like that's also something somewhat clever. You better get your butt back. I'm holding this whole <laughs> class for you. I told you. Where are you going? <laughs> I have somewhere to be. Nonsense. Sit down. Uh, I'll catch up. Dirty slut. You better come with the next three chapters okay. read. Okay. Yeah. Can Suckers made into a 10 week class and deuces out be an hour early. Literally said to me, he's going to say something when I leave. Yeah, yeah. You know I am, of course. <laughs> That's why I like you better than your old man. He's not bad, but you got him beat. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, let's let's. Uh, I want I want to be I want to point this out one more time uh, because I want to make this I, I want to say this explicitly. These print lines here are clever, right? And it never occurred to me that they're clever until you asked this question. The reason why these are clever is because without these print lines, Rust can do totally different things because it can free all of these variables up whenever it wants. So all of these variables are being held, right? And the destruction, the freeing of them is being stopped because they are later being referenced in the print statements. So these print statements are not merely diagnostic. They allow the, these error statements and this logic of the book to continue. OK. That's, that's an interesting observation. Uh, move the print line, and they could just dump all of them, right? Yeah, because if, if you move the print line, it'll say, R1, we no longer need you. You're no longer being referenced, so this doesn't exist anymore. R2, you're not being used anymore, so you don't exist anymore. I don't need to keep that around. R3, this is mutable. I'll keep that around. Okay, that makes sense. And it, it would totally work, you know? So the reason why that whole process, the whole book doesn't fall apart is because you've got to pay attention. This is not just giving you diagnostics. This is holding, it's saying, I need to have access to all these three things, so don't pull your shenanigans, you know? Uh, OK, cool. Uh, let mute s equals string from hello. And I bet that's also something really interesting, that if you get the first edition of the Rust book and you try to run it today, it probably won't work. I bet it lacks them. Uh, let mute s equals string hello. Let r1 equals the ampersand s. r2 equals ampersand s. Reference to s, better. Uh, and then we're printing. Both of these work. Now here's the key, exactly. So here, 
This is where it's being explicit about that observation. We have the print statement right here, and then right below it, it says variables R1 and R2 will not be used after this point. They're making it clear that the print statement is what's making them used. This code will compile because the last usage of the immutable references, the print line, occurs before the immutable reference is introduced, right? Now here, R1 and R2 are dead, the immutable reference is there, and it works, okay. I would have known that if I reread the entire material before doing this. Okay. Uh, let main, we're doing, okay, this is the dangle, they're showing you how you can't create a dangling reference. Does anyone know what a dangling reference is? Let's go over that, that term, dangling reference. Okay, so in, in C, and by the way, when it comes to explaining why Rust is so much better, we always pick on C. It's just the way things work. Because it always, it gets everything wrong. You know, it's just an older way of doing things. So in C, you have a, a pointer, and it's only ever a pointer to a location in memory, right? Doesn't have capacity, doesn't have length, doesn't have anything. And the question is, what happens when you free the thing behind the pointer? We talked about you create this area in the heap where you store this word hello. What happens if you free that and you don't get rid of the pointer? What is it now pointing to? Could be anything. If you, most security vulnerabilities are a result of these types of exploits. Where someone frees something up behind them and then they get something totally new to be stored there and now it's a jump point. Now you think that you're, you're going to something you know, and suddenly it's a different instruction. You know, it's a, it's a, they change a jump, or they get a password to be stored in there, and now you think you're reading from a block that has, you know, grandma's date of birth or whatever, and instead it's got her social security number. Uh, all of these are like areas in which a dangling, we would say it's a dangling reference. You have manipulated the area underneath the reference, and you did not update the reference. Rust has zero of these. You never have to worry about them. Here's an example of a semantic that would create it if it would compile. So now we're back in the world of I can't explain to you what's actually happening simply because it won't work, right? I can explain to you why it's not going to work and that's it. I, I can't say like, well, you know, let's pretend like it worked and explain, I I'll just tell you, this doesn't work. The reason why this doesn't work is because dangle is returning a reference to a string, right? Here, S is owning the string, and you're returning a reference to it. So what happens when you own something? What did I start off this whole class saying ownership was about? How it gets cleaned up, exactly. How it gets cleaned up. So this function called dangle is owning, we all agree, at this line right here, it is owning this thing called S, right, which is, a pointer to an area in the heap, right? Now, we're saying because it's owning it, it is responsible for cleaning it up. Now, did it move ownership outside? No. What is it doing? It's giving a reference to that. And Rust is saying, you're responsible for cleaning it up. So when you go out of scope, it's gone. And you're giving someone else a reference to that thing that you have? That's impossible. End of story. Will not compile, right? Uh, and, and because it won't compile, things in Rust can get a little wacky, right? Like there'll be areas where you see things where you'll be like, how do I get out of this problem? And we'll go into some of those later on. And I'll show you where that actually can be a lot more confusing than you want it to be. But the, there is no way around this, right? So here's another question. If you want Dangle to return a string, how would you do it? Change the function to return the string so something else owns it, and then you can return the owned copy of the string. You can move it out. Uh, okay, let's address it a different way. Could a function ever return a reference to a string? Don't answer this one, Josh. I know you know the answer. Yeah, I mean, I would think it could if it's referenced multiple times as a function. You would think it, it could if it's what? If the function is referenced multiple times. You call the function multiple times? I don't know. No. No? Okay. But it sounded good. <laughs> but totally wrong. <laughs> Not even one person. No, okay. Uh, what, what's up? So if you pass out the reference to a string to the function, and then you return that to the reference value. Boom. That's one case, sure. Something else has to own it, right? 
a function can return a reference to a string, but something outside of that function has to own it. The only thing that can't own it is the function. That's it. Anything else can own it. The function just knows it can't own it because it's over. That's what the compiler is checking. Something external to the function owns it and it's valid. The function can take that reference and return that reference. It can take that reference as mutable, mutate it, and return a mutable reference. It can do all those kinds of things. Uh, but, you know, it, it, can't, uh, it can't return the reference that the data it owns. And it, it even tells you right here, by the way. Th this is the error. So you screw this up, it straight up tells you. You can't return the reference, just remove it. Uh, all right. It's telling you here, it's showing that it doesn't work. Okay. There's nothing new there. The solution, there we go. The solution's removed the ampersand. Okay, good. And now the slice type. Okay. So. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, so, first word is taking a string, right? And it's going to return a part of that string, right? That, the semantics of the slice are different, but you can use the same word for it. It's a part of a string. The difference is that that part of the string doesn't work like capital string. Why? Anyone want to think about this? What is a string? It has three different elements on the fat pointer. What is the fat pointer? Location. Location, length, capacity. capacity. Okay. Let's say you're going to return uh, a segment inside of it. What are you going to need? No. No. Why would you ever need capacity? Location, Location and length. Because you're pointing to a piece of memory inside of that string. Why would you never need capacity? Because you're only referencing a small number. It's not going to change. It's mutable. Well, let's say it is mutable. Why would you never need because the. Because the compiler is smart enough to not let you do dumb things and go out of bounds. Because they can just reference the location of what you want to see. Because there is no case in which changing the middle of the string, growing the capacity, or shrinking the capacity is acceptable to the string you're in. What would it look like if you shrunk the string? You can shrink a string. You can drop the capacity, truncate it. There's actually a truncate method on a string. What would it mean if you truncated a, a segment of a string, the inside of a string? Let's say you have this word right here. Let's take something really easy here. You have, uh, here, let's leave all this stuff. Let's say you have something like this. You have foo bar baz, right? This is, let's pseudocode this. Let s equals foo bar baz. Uh, if you, let's put it in string, so I hate this, stupid. You kids, they can't write two, they can't write two quotation marks. Why don't you highlight the whole thing? <laughs> yeah, if you highlight and just hit it once, it'll surround. So wait, you're supposed to do like what? How are you supposed to do this today? How do you quote a string of the modern editor? B, end line. And then I did the quote sign and I got this? No. <laughs> That's useful? That's what you want? I don't know if you have the plugin, but you will S A quotation after you highlight. How about it, SA quotation? SA quotation. It says main modified. By the way, this is, you, you were the lazy vim guy, right? You're the lazy, you got me to use this shit. You don't know how to quote things in it. I didn't get you to use it. If I got you to use it, I would teach you If it's, if it's, no, what about capital S and then quotes? Yeah, it's because you don't have meaning. This is, this is where my ADHD, this has nothing to do with Rust. Yes, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, we figure, we find out how to quote a string. So we have the string here, foobar baz. Let's say that you want to reference now just the baz part, right? What do you need to point to, rather just bar? Let's look at just bar. What do we need to point to just bar? Location. Location? And the length. You know how many characters it has, right? And I keep getting out of the question, what use would capacity be? You can't shrink it, you can't grow it. It's not of any use. Right? So I'm saying there's a difference here between a string slice, which has only got the pointer and the length, and the capacity. Right? So here's where, where they're getting at. We take this here, first word. First word is taking a reference to a string, not a string slice, and it's returning a U size. And that U size represents the length, right? Whatever. Uh, let's come down here. Here's where we're in no? None of this stuff is new, by the way. We're not getting to anything new yet. I want to get to where we're getting new things. 
string slices. Here we go. Okay. So here's where we have hello world, and now we have this guy right here, where we're saying we want a slice. Has, has anyone ever seen this syntax right here in the middle? Okay. No more questions. No more answers from you for five minutes, because you got them all down. You you know it. This is a range, right? So we've seen these we've seen these before, and we covered it. Does anyone remember the last time this came up? That's not an insult, by the way. You're just way ahead. D does, does anyone remember where we last talked about ranges? What did I say about them? We talked about them in the first class. We, I introduced you dot dot equals, right? I thought it was something kind of cool. Rust has the ability to say from this thing in the range, the start, up to and including the end. So Rust has the dot dot equal thing. We had it in the first chapter. Anyway, this is saying from zero up to and not including five. From six up to and not including 11. We're taking two different parts of that string, two different slices of it, right, is what they're showing you here. And now here's what it looks like, right? We have S, which is the string. S equals the piece in the heap that owns hello world. Now we have world down here, and that equals the six, the pointer to the six, and the length of five it equals the rest of it, right? Uh, OK, and then. Hello actually equals the first part. They don't show it. But hello would actually be just like world, and it would point to this and go up to this part, the hello part. So they actually create two string slices, and they don't, they don't show it. They just show S, you know? OK. Rust dot dot range syntax. This is also kind of cool. Uh, Rust will figure out the end if you exclude it, or the beginning if you exclude it. You don't have to do anything goofy to say the last like a negative one or something, it just, it knows. So they're just showing you that the range syntax supports going up to and including everything from either a point in the beginning, you can say everything before it, or you can say everything after it. Uh, three dot dot, yeah, and you can include variables there. So they're just showing you that you can have length as an actual variable and it'll work fine. All right, so here's an example where we are returning a slice of the entire string. So they're saying, what did we lose or get from this, right? We have this thing called first word. First word is taking, and I, I want everyone to pay attention to these words because I'm trying to parse them and be very clear about it. It's taking a what? I want someone else to tell me what this is. We're going to start talking Rust. It's a reference of the string. Reference to a string. Boom, you're done. OK, and it's returning this. This is the new thing here. And we simply say this is a string slice, right? So now we're returning a string slice. Now, what did we lose in this process? The objectiveness of the string. Well, we still have some objectiveness, right? Because a string slice isn't just a pointer. Well. No, we lost the capacity. Right, it's very simple. We're returning, and by the way, a lot of people got it right. I just wanted to make sure they weren't very loud. I wanted to give the back people some more time to think, make it a little bit more torturous. Uh, the string slice loses the capacity. So now we're returning this thing, and all we know now is from what character until what character. Right? Here's something else that's also very useful to know in Rust. When you declare functions, what kind of thing are you going to take? Are you going to require capital string? Right? Are you going to require the actual string type? Are you going to require a reference to the string, or are you going to require a string slice? It depends, right? But here's what I would say. Anytime you're not modifying the string, you should always accept the string slice, because it will work with everything. The worst case scenario, you provided something with a capacity that it doesn't need, and it just ignores it. Rust will coerce uh, any string reference to a string slice. So a string slice is more liberal. A string slice can accept a string slice or a reference to a string. If you require a reference to a string, you can no longer pass a string slice, right? Because the string slice is more conservative. It, 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 has a, it is a less useful type. Uh, all right. So. Here's what we do down here. They're saying returning a slice would also work in the second word function. So this function extracts the first word. It's looking. We should explain this function too. It's not actually the point of this to explain the function, so I kind of left it out. But I'll, let's actually talk through it this time. Uh, we're taking the string and we're looking at it as in bytes, right? 
There is a good way to iterate over a string, and then there's a bad way to iterate over a string. This is the bad way, right? Because this way doesn't understand Unicode. You're going to look at every different byte and say, what is it? So we are iterating over every different byte in the string, and we're saying, uh, is that byte equal to a space? That's right down here. That's the B. The B, single quote, space, single quote, that is a byte literal, right, for the, the space, whatever the space equals in ASCII. And we're saying, if we got the space, then what I want to do is return everything from zero dot dot I. That slice from the beginning until I. Now here's an interesting observation. They just told us we don't need the zero. We could drop it, and that's true. So they wasted one character. Shame on them. But the dot dot I thing, what does that actually mean? Anyone want to? It's including everything up to, up to the iterable. Beautiful. Up to, but not including that last thing. It's exclusive. Yes? Uh, so this is by, by, by. So like, because I know like in Ross, it's already going to be like UTF-8, I think, so it can, like each character can be different amounts of bytes, I think. Uh, yes. It, well, but it's... Technically, like, think that it's a space, but it's not. He's asking but about offsets. Uh, it, it, will it ever think it's a space when it's not? No. Right? But that's because of the, the semantics of UTF-8. But that's not to say that it will... Uh, uh, it will be problematic for other reasons. I don't want to, let's have that conversation later. Because how UTF-8 works is beyond the point here. The, what I would say is that th it's not looking at characters, it's looking at bytes, and that is problematic for other reasons. Yes. All right. Uh, returning a slice would also just work for a second function. And then we have second word, and we're doing the same thing. So big deal. Now this one fails, why does it fail? Well, we have this mutable s, which is a string, type, and we are saying let word equals the first word. So now we are giving first word a reference to s, and then we're calling s.clear. And why will that not work? Does anyone want to give that a crack? OK, let's look at it. We have a mutable type S, and we are now passing an immutable reference, right? So we're giving to first word uh, an immutable reference. That means an immutable reference exists, right? Down here, we are saying we want to print out the word. And then we are calling s.clear. What is the problem with this? The problem is how first word is defined. First word is defined up here as Taking a string slice, a reference to a slice, ra rather, taking a reference to a string, blah, 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 taking a reference to a string and returning a string slice, right? And a string slice has the pointer and it has the length. Now, how can I take that reference to a string and return the pointer and the length and then clear it? That's impossible. So Russ knows that's impossible. And how does it know? It knows right here. You cannot borrow s as mutable because it is already borrowed as immutable. God, I can't believe I just did that again. Borrow s, there we go. OK, I forgot the quotes. Right here. So the problem here is that we have the immutable borrow here, and then we have the mutable borrow here. Yes? So basically, my understanding is that because you're returning Yes, exactly. I would say it is, uh, yes. You can say it shorter than that even though. You can say a string slice that you're returning is an immutable reference. That's it. And the giant rule in Rust is one mutable reference or any amount of immutable references. This down here, s.clear, S, because you are calling s.clear, what is clear? Here's next level Rust. We haven't covered any of this stuff yet, but you can just reason about what clear is and how it works. I like that. Let's go over that. Let's let's because that's exactly where I want to go. You're not exactly right. It is a, certainly a method that empties a string, but what do we know about this method that empties the string? 
we know what does the type signature of that look like? What is it taking? It takes a mutable reference to self. Yes, it takes a mutable reference to self, exactly. And how do we know it takes a mutable reference to self? By the way, he's cheating. Here you took the class. Come out like him. How do we know it takes a mutable reference to self, Josh? Um, we know it takes a mutable reference to self. Well, I mean, saying that a mutable borrow occurs, that's the main reason. Yada, yada, yada. Yad. Stop cheating. Why do you know that it doesn't take the actual ownership of self? Um, it's an implicit call. I don't remember. OK. Not a good, not a good example of me. No. Because it would get destroyed. Right I like there. that. That's beautiful. That's great. If, it, if, if clear took self, it would either get destroyed or. <coughs> Whoa. <coughs> okay, Harvard. I'm sorry. Who's getting destroyed? <laughs> <coughs> it did say it would rock my world. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, I should have brought water. I actually did, and then I drank it all before I started the class. Yeah, Fail. Okay. Uh, if it took the actual ownership of self, it would either have to uh, uh, free it or return it. Something has to own it. So if you take ownership, you either have to free the thing, destroy it, right, when, you, when it runs out of scope, or you have to give it back. And how do we know <clears throat> it doesn't give it back? No assignment. no assignment. Boom. No assignment. So that's how you can reason about it. So in Rust, you can learn, and, and by the way, in any, any, any strongly typed language, you can learn a lot just by looking at type signatures. I can tell you a great deal about what code does just by looking at the type signature. I'll give you a case in point. Let's say you take a string, right? The only thing you take is a string, and you return a number. What's that, uh, what's that function do? Length. Huh? Length. Length. Exactly. It's easy. And you can pretty much do this any time. Let's say that I, I, I take a string and a single character. What is that going to do? Well, sure, that's one thing, but what if it returns a number? Takes a string, takes a, a single character, returns a number. What does it do? Returns the index of that, that character. First instance of that character. Well, then it would return a pointer. What if it returns a number? Yeah, it returns the position of that first character. If it returns a pointer, but I said it returns a number. Function takes a string and a single character and returns a number. You're telling me function takes a string and a single character and returns a pointer. The oh, the offset? Yeah, they could do that, yeah. Or it could just count the amount of characters you got, right? Yeah, either one of those would be fine. Anyway, I'm just saying that you can, when you look at the function signatures, you can infer a lot about what a function does or could do just by looking at them, and you can reason about them. You know, those are two different possibilities, sure, and there may be three, but that's still not that many, right? And you can start to say, and, and one of the things that I actually do sometimes is names suck, right? You always want to know what a function does, and people name them something stupid. Like my favorite one today is configure. Uh, yes, in a module called conf, there's a function called configure. Anyone want to guess? Uh, horrible, but I'm saying like this kind of stuff is uh, naming is hard anyway, right? So we all kind of screw it up. But I'm saying when you have a function signature, you can reason about what it does. So if it returns a configure object, you know it's a constructor, right? That's always the case. If it returns an object self, or the, it returns the object in the package, you're constructing. You don't need it to be called new. You can just tell, you know. Uh, all right. So string literals is slices. We have this thing here. Let s equals hello comma world, and we want to uh, we want to look at that, right? So we talked about before how we had this notion of a string literal. A string literal is a string slice, right? I I use the word literal because that's the same in every language. A literal means it's constructed from text you gave it, and everything can be determined at compile time. That's the definition of a literal. Whether it's a number, a five, a string, whatever, those are all given as literal values. Uh, here they're showing you that when you construct a literal, hello world, you construct a string slice. You take that and you put that somewhere. If it's in a function, it's on the stack. And you have now a pointer and a length for it. Anyone have any questions? They're just showing you different ways to construct a literal. And here's a question. Let's say I have this s, and now it is a string slice to a literal that we've given it. How do I create a string type from it? You create a new constructor. Mary. 
What was your answer? From. Got it. String colon colon from. String colon colon from takes a string slice and it gives you back a string. It constructs the string. It is a type constructor, as, as you said earlier. All right. Uh, now we're getting the whole parameterization thing, and we talked about that. I talked about that earlier. I said that the reference to a string is less useful than the string slice. Because in order to have a reference to a string, you have to have a capacity. And a string slice doesn't necessarily have to have a capacity. So the bottom implementation of first word can accept a literal. The top implementation, you have to create that block of memory in the heap. You have to say string from and give that the literal. You don't want to do that because then you always got to move things to the heap. The bottom implementation, that can work on the stack. So it is more useful to accept a string slice than a string literal. So, remember, so a string slice is a pointer memory. So does that mean you create a literal? You just create like an unnamed block of memory without text? No, I'm sorry, say, say it one more time. Like a string slice is just a pointer to a place of memory. Right. So, with what? It's a pointer to replace a memory with what? With, like, with what? what? What does the pointer have to have? Sorry? What does the pointer have to have? A length. There we go. Okay. Continue. So when you create a literal, you say it's a string slice. Does that mean you create like an unnamed block of memory with that string? Uh, you could say the literal is the block of memory with the string in it. And the string slice is the pointer to that, which has the length. Yes. So you could look at the, if you were to look at the binary in a program, and we could do this later, not at all part of this class, I could show you exactly where in the binary, if it's not in a function, the string literal exists. I can say that's where it is. And it's going to have all kinds of shit next to it. Right? So if I take something like this, and we want to, here, I'll just show you really quick, just so we have an idea of how you know, things are. Here's a list of all the different programs I have. I could take something, I have ZSH in there, and I can run string ZSH. It's going to go find all of the strings for ZSH in there, right? If I look at the binary, it's not true of all of them. But the vast majority of these, especially all the constants, those all get shoved to the same block inside of the, the binary. They're all up at the very top in read-only memory, right? And when you launch that binary, it copies all that shit into RAM. One after another, after another, after another. There may not be any spaces in between them. And if you're not using C, there won't even be null characters in between them. Right? That's where the literal exists if it's not in a function. Right? So that's where the, the, the block of memory is. Now, the string slice points to it and it says, I have a length of five. And it points to that area. Does that make sense? All right. OK. They're showing you different ways to create slices. We can create slices with ranges. We can take a, a slice to the entire thing with dot, dot. That's effectively a shorthand for eliminating the capacity. Uh, you can, you have a question? I have a question. Yeah. I think there's a way to do this, but for ranges, there's a way to make a range inclusive, right, of your last item. Dot, dot equals. OK, yeah, yeah. I was thinking. All right. Just want to make sure. Other slices. Let A equals, and we have an array here, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's an array of five elements. Arrays are strongly typed on length. Uh, and then here we say let slice equals, and now we're taking a slice of that array. It works the same way. Now we have an array slice, not a string slice. And we're saying assert equals the slice is the same, and it's fine. All right. And that is good. We're 830. So I wasn't expecting to get through with five. And that sucks because five was easy and this shit was a lot harder. But like I said, we'll come back and we'll do five. Five is a lot easier. And we did the whole day on four, you know? So, but I, I promise, I think most of the days we will do two chapters. I don't think we'll ever get another three done, but, but we should be able to do two, you know? Cool. And sorry, this is, this is one of the rougher ones, you know? And it, like I said, you're going to hit your head against it. And when you learn Rust, you're going to do everything wrong. And the compiler is going to tell you it all to, that it's all wrong. And the, one of the only things that I can do here is help you uh, understand how it's supposed to work and what you have to do. And it'll tell you what you have to do. Does anyone have any questions on it? Did anyone give Rustlings a shot? Uh, I've, I've actually had it for a while, like 25 percent. Uh,
Like yeah, lots. It's faster than the book for me. It's I've learned so much more. I can. Uh, I don't want to show them now because I'm being recorded. It's client code. I mean, I'm a contractor. I own the code, the way it works. But I don't want people to know who my clients are. Uh, do I have any? Wants to see dumb code that you wrote. Uh, I'm trying to think if I have any dumb Rust code. I don't. I don't know the actual answer to that question. Uh, so it's only for work right now. Ooh. I can't believe I mean, I certainly have contributed to open source Rust projects. I just don't know whether or not I have any open source Rust projects I created myself. You know, it's kind of weird to show you like a patch for Rust. You know, a Rust project. But. Oh, Evan, uh, is is there any way, like the standard library, to compare a number to like an even or odd, like status? An even or odd status. So to tell whether a number is even, even or odd. Here. Mod, mod two. Yeah. Mod two. Yeah, but I'm sure. Yeah, mod two will work. It'll always work. So how would you use mod two? You would do number mod percent sign two. And then if that equals one, it's odd. Because mod is going to take the number, divide it by two. If you get a remainder, you're odd. Oh, OK. I think that makes sense. It's good as a mod. Cool. That's it. Wow. We're best friends. Basically. What's that? When was the last time you were asked? When was the last time you were asked what? Literally. Yeah. Uh, cool. All right. Yeah. I want to I want to hit Brian up on Godbolt so I can show him this. Uh, Brian, I want to show you this. I'm going to give you a compiler you can annoy all day long. Come here. Have you ever seen this before? Yeah, that's assembly. Right. Uh, this will take whatever you want and compile it in whatever you want. This is a great way for you to analyze code in any language online okay. at the lowest level. So the questions that you were asking were fundamentally, how does the compiler optimization work, right? Yeah, well, I sent you a picture. Basically, because I was confused, because it seems like the documentation then is just not explaining exactly what is going on. Because if you yeah. look at the documentation, never claims to explain what the compiler does. Well, it only explains how you can think about it and model the program in your head. Well, you would think if